Let's now take a look at the effects of these input bias currents at the output. As we did with the offset voltage imperfections, we'll use the principle of superposition to study just the effect of the input bias currents at the output for both inverting and non-inverting amplifiers. We have here the schematic of the, um, of the op amp showing the bias currents and also showing the feedback network. Now we've deactivated any signal sources and pulled those inputs then to ground. That has the effect then of isolating and allowing us to see just the effects of the two bias currents. Now you'll notice that by shorting the um, the uh, non-inverting terminal to ground, by virtue of the virtual short, that also pulls the inverting terminal to ground. And so there'll be no current flowing through R1. Well, as the input bias current is drawing a current, the only place that it can draw a current then is through the feedback loop. And if we then calc we can calculate the output voltage by simply starting here at zero, and we're going against the current, so we're going up in voltage. With the feedback circuit in place, the output voltage is simply going to be IB1 times R2. Now we can reduce this effect by adding a third resistor, R3, to the non-inverting terminal. Now this provides a resistance here and as current IB2 is flowing through it, it then creates a voltage drop from ground, drops this down, so the voltage here now is negative IB2 times R3. IB2 the input bias current times R3. Again, the virtual short transfers this voltage to the inverting terminal also. Now over here, there was no voltage drop across R1, so there was no current going through there. By pulling this input down, it pulls this input down, which now provides a voltage so the current can be flowing through R1. The current flowing through R1 is going to be the voltage across R1, which is IB2 times R3. That's the voltage there. 0 minus that voltage is the voltage across there is IB2 R3 divided by R1 to give us the current. Now, coming with this node, we now have three currents associated with it. This one, this one, and this current that we'll just call the feedback current for now. We can determine the feedback current by doing a Kirchhoff current law, uh, writing a KCL equation at that terminal. So summing the currents at the inverting terminal, we have then entering the node, we have IB2R3 over R1, it's entering, so it'll be a negative. IB2 times R3 divided by R1. Then we have the feedback current also entering, and again, we're just going to call that I sub F right now. The feedback current entering the node, so it'll be a minus I sub F. And then we have IB1 leaving the node, so plus IB1. The sum of those three currents equals zero. We can then solve for the feedback current. I sub F then is equal to IB1 minus IB2, and let's write it like this, IB2 times R3 over R1. And that's the current here that's being shown in the blue. What we note is that in the previous circuit, without R3 present, the current, the feedback current, was IB1. By putting this resistor in there and dropping the voltage at these two points, we introduce a new source or a new place for current to flow. And so the feedback current, instead of being IB1, it's IB1 minus the current that's coming through R1. We can now write an expression for V out. V out then will equal the voltage here, which is negative IB2R3, plus the voltage drop across the feedback resistor, or plus R2 times this current, IB1 minus IB2 times R3 over R1. 
that then becomes the output voltage due to the input, input bias currents. Now at this point, to make the calculations just a little bit easier, we're going to say that the input bias currents IB1 and IB2 can be replaced with I sub B, the average input bias current. You'll notice here that we have terms involving IB2 and IB1. So we're just going to replace each of those terms with the average I sub B. And when we do that, we can factor out that I sub B. And we get then that V out is equal to I sub B times R2 minus R3 times 1 plus R2 over R1. You can stop the, the video and, and go through and, and prove that that's correct. All I've done again is just replaced IB1 and IB2 with I sub B, factored out the I sub B, and then combined the terms involving R3. There's a, a term here with R3 and a term here with R3. Alrighty. V out then can be written like this. And we'll notice we've got R2 minus this thing right there. If we set that equal to zero, and then solve for R3, we should be able to find the value of R3 that will make this term go to zero, which would then, at least ideally, zero out the output voltage component due to the input bias currents. So when we do that, we then get R2 is equal to R3 times 1 plus R2 over R1. Now, solving that for R3, we get then that, um, let's, let's do one more step here. Let's put this over a common denominator. So we have R2 is equal to R3 times R1 plus R2 over R1. Now, when we solve for R3, it's obvious that we get R3 is equal to R1, R2 over R1 plus R2. And at first, we recognize then that what we're saying is that the value of R3 should equal the parallel equivalent of R1 and R2. And at first that may seem a little bit surprising, but if you think of it in terms of what is the effective resistance that this current supply, this current source, sees as it looks back out from the inputs? Well, up here it sees R1 going to ground, and because we're talking about the effective uh, and the effective resistance, we're talking about the Thevenin resistance, we can go ahead and short this out. It's just a voltage source. We can short it out, which then pulls R1 and R2 into parallel with each other. And again, this result is saying that if we want to minimize the output voltage due to the input bias currents, we need to make the resistance that each of these sources see be the same. So the take-home message is adding R3 with a value equal to the parallel combination of R1 and R2 will minimize the effects of the input bias currents at the output.